Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Joy Project. I'm Krista Abampato, your host, and I'm so excited you're back with us for our second interview episode. I met Carolyn Keel almost a decade ago through a mutual friend, and although I barely knew her at the time, she always supported my projects right from the get-go. She came to my events. She often sent me things that she thought would interest me, books, other contacts for people I could collaborate with in my work, interesting articles, job postings. One of the temples of her life and career has been lifting up others in a million different ways. And I'm so happy that she agreed to sit down with me to talk about what brings her joy so that I can lift up all the incredible work that she's been doing and the wonderful person that she is. It came as absolutely no surprise to me when I asked her what brings her joy. She said podcasting. Her podcast, Beyond Six Seconds, has been one of my favorites for years. Also not surprising, the entire premise for the podcast is about lifting up the stories of other people. And now she's specifically focused on lifting up the stories of people in the neurodivergent community. So without further ado, please welcome Carolyn Keel. Carolyn, welcome to Joy Project. Thanks, Krista. I'm happy to be here. I am so excited to talk to you today. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Carolyn, please tell me and everybody listening something that brings you joy. I find my joy in podcasting. So it's a hobby. I have an entirely separate career, but I've had my own podcast for a little over four years. It's called Beyond Six Seconds. I started it originally just to have a creative outlet, a creative hobby and project. After I had been singing in an acapella group in New York City, I wound up taking another job like further out in New Jersey. Couldn't get down to the city as much. It's like, well, I still need to do something creative. And I wasn't able to do singing at that time. So I decided to try out podcasting. I figured I would interview some of my friends who I either knew through social media or knew in my, my offline life about the interesting projects that they were working on. Sort of like think what, what they were passionate about, because it's pretty easy to to talk to people about what excites them. So I figured that would be a good place to start. I kept it very broad at the time. After the first couple of guests and episodes, it just started taking off. So I interviewed a whole variety of you know people who were starting their own businesses or leading volunteer projects or just had a really interesting hobby. It was pretty broad. I did that for almost four years. And then last year, I went through some personal changes and realizations that brought me to change the focus of my podcast. So it's actually got a, a little bit more narrow focus, which is uh, helpful, more of a niche focus, I should say. Now, starting in 2022, at the beginning of this year, I am interviewing neurodivergent people, people who are either autistic, have ADHD, Tourette syndrome, dyslexia, dyspraxia, other dyscalculia, other conditions like that. Because at the end of last year, I was actually diagnosed as autistic. Realizing what it looks like in women and girls and getting an official diagnosis, starting actually to make friends at the time within the autistic and neurodivergent communities. It became a uh, passion of mine to just for myself, hear more stories and just hear more sort of common experiences from people either growing up or in, in their current adult lives. And two, to just be able to share that with other people to see this is really what it's like as a neurodivergent adult to live. These are the challenges that we've had. These are the successes that we've had. And it's so different based on your background, your level of support needs, your race and your gender and your age. And so there's just so many stories to share. So I'm really excited about that. And it brings me a lot of joy. That's so exciting. And I love that you took something that for some people getting that type of diagnosis in some ways could be affirming. It could also be very upsetting yeah. right, to, to realize that that's happening and to realize that you wanted to turn that around and tell joyful stories and, and not shy away from the difficulty, right. but celebrate the other side of it, which we certainly don't see represented in media. We don't see it represented on television. We may have people in our lives that we don't even realize are going through that and are managing that type of diagnosis and what it means to live and to live well with that type of diagnosis. Will you continue to talk about passion projects of people who are neurodivergent? We still talk. Honestly, we talk about a lot of the same things. So if they may have their own businesses, some of them work in corporate careers, some of them are still students, some of them are artists. So it, it's really fascinating to see sort of where everybody is on their journey and how neurodivergence really plays into how they've grown up and gone through school and kind of how it impacts your career. So some people really tried to go the corporate route and either weren't supported there or just figured out it wasn't for them and became entrepreneurs or started following their own separate passion projects. And other people still work in the corporate world and they talk about the challenges they have there, how they have to advocate for themselves and other issues like that. So it's pretty broad so far from what I'm finding. And as far as finding joy in podcasting, can you talk a little bit about you were a fan of podcasts, you were a fan of connecting with people. 
how did you make that jump to realize, oh, not only do I want to be a fan of podcasts and support people who are either on podcasts or creating them, but I actually want to create one myself. Yeah, it's interesting. It actually happened pretty quickly, which is, you know, sometimes I tend to overthink things, but this I really didn't. For some reason, I kind of jumped into it. I was a fan of podcasts and I just decided towards, I think it was towards the end of 2017, even around like November, like right before Thanksgiving. It's like, you know, I've been a singer and I've worked on like our website. I've done audio recording. So I know a little bit about audio recording, a little bit about how to use a microphone. So like the technology piece, I felt like I was pretty good at. So it's like, I already have that basis. So I can just quickly teach myself the rest of the pieces of, you know, how to put together a podcast, like what kind of hosting services you need and like all all these other things. So I felt like I had a little bit of the journey already getting started with that. And then I just did a little bit every day. It's like, I'm going to research what my hosting service is. I'm going to research like how to get distributed to all the sites and how to title and write show notes and just a little bit every day and then interviewed probably over like 150 people. And I'm still nervous every single time that I start. Like I always get that panic right before, like, I don't know. And then it's amazing. Like as soon as we start off, it's great. But at the beginning I said, well, I'll start with my friends because if I screw up the recording, like they won't be mad at me and it's kind of low stakes. So if anyone wants to podcast and do an interview based one, like you kind of, I would recommend starting out like that. Just Find your friendly guests who are sympathetic and understand that, you know, things may go wrong. But you're just starting it out. I didn't really have a lot of fears besides, you know, the, the same nervousness that I always get before I have this conversation with someone. But, you know, I don't have to make money off of this or I don't have to reach particularly a sort of goal. It's like, let me just try this out for fun, a creative thing and maybe help some people. And what is it about podcasting specifically that brings you joy? Is it the finding a really great guest, having the conversation? There, there's so much production that happens on the back end and, and you're a one person show, right? You do everything on your podcast from setting up the guests, doing the recordings, all of the back end work, the distribution, the marketing, everything. Is it really that whole package or are there certain parts of it that you just get into a groove with? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of pieces that bring me a lot of joy. So I do have some support with editing and some support with putting together my graphics for social media, my audiograms, and some help with show notes, but I'm over-involved in every part of it. I love looking for guests. I love looking for interesting stories. And like once I started doing that, I kind of got like an eye and a feel for what I was looking for. So I love finding stories and reaching out. And I, I wind up with then like a long waiting list of guests, which is awesome. That's exciting for me. And I love the recording. I really like the editing process, which a lot of people think is tedious and they try to outsource the whole thing. And while I do get quite a bit of help with that, I still like going through and listening and making the decisions about, all right, what parts need to be cut out or what parts need to be cleaned up. And I like to record now a little bit of a short two to three minute intro in the beginning that just sort of introduces, this is what you're going to hear about, or here are my thoughts. I still do a lot of the editing, which I know a lot of people don't necessarily enjoy because it is kind of tedious, but I find it relaxing. You kind of get into a groove and it takes a lot of time, but I, but I enjoy that as well. And where did you come up with the name Beyond Six Seconds? I'm always so intrigued to find out how people name things and how does that really convey the ethos of what it is that you're doing? That was one of the last things that I had to figure out before I could launch was I really didn't have a good name for this podcast. I got the name Beyond Six Seconds from career study that was done about recruiters only look at your resume for about six seconds before they make a decision as to do you want to advance your resume to the next round or do they kind of put it together and, and dump it in the trash? And I don't know how legit that survey was. It's sort of a statistic that gets thrown around a lot. So I said, okay, well, at the time I was really focused on people's career and what they're doing. So I said, I want to go beyond six seconds and give people a little more time so they don't have to get their pitch down really solid. They don't have to just present like a one-sided story where they've got the full narrative, like all prescripted. I want to leave time for those messy conversations about what worked, what didn't work and where did you have to adjust? And and even, you know, a lot of times we interview people and it, it's almost they're presenting themselves at like the end of the story. It's like, yes, I've reached the mountaintop and this is my thing. But I mean, how real is that? really. Like a lot of people are just sort of in the middle of figuring stuff out. And it's like, well, I don't really know if this is going to work, but this is what I'm doing now. So I wanted to kind of embrace that ambiguity and those challenges. And you need more than six seconds to do that. So I wanted to provide that platform for people. Is there a particular conversation or even several conversations that really stand out? 
and I always mention this one now, is was probably the beginning of my own journey about learning more about autism and what it really looks like in adults was probably almost a year ago now. I interviewed a uh, YouTuber. His name is Hunter Hansen. He runs a YouTube channel called The Life Autistic. I found him like when Instagram Reels first launched, showed up in my discovery tab. Oh, this is like a really cool reel. So I just started following him. I read his blog because he also is a, a blogger. He was a blogger before YouTube. So he kind of outlined his whole story of how he started writing and how he came to terms and he wanted to talk more about being autistic more openly. And then he started a YouTube channel and then he started with Instagram. So I'm like, oh, this is like a great story outline. Like this is, you know, this is like the outline for a conversation that I'd love to have reached out to him and we set up some time to talk and talking with him just felt so comfortable. And I just loved hearing the way that he presents his story. And we talked literally about how he decided to talk more openly about being autistic and also his process for creating YouTube content. And then towards the end, how he is really passionate about helping autistic and other neurodivergent people in the corporate world, because he has his own corporate job on top of all this other stuff that, that he's been doing. So how can he be an advocate for that? And I think that's something that he's even focusing more on these days. That really started me saying like, all right, I want to follow more autistic content creators and just sort of see what people are talking about and learn more about autism and how it presents in girls and women. And then over time, over a, a course of several months is like when I realized like, oh, okay, this is, this is what this looks like. And it's not at all like what I learned growing up in like the 80s and 90s about autism, like what we all learned, those stereotypes that have just totally, mostly not true and have totally evolved. And uh, it's very, very different. That conversation really stands out for me. And then it really wasn't until I found a blog uh, that focused on what autism looks like in women and girls. And that's when it really clicked for me. People's thinking processes. I was very comfortable in those communities. So I just thought I was a happy ally that I could kind of hang out in here. But as soon as I read about this is what it looks like. Oh, yeah. All these things that I was labeled and called growing up are actually or could be indications of autism. Again, nothing is definite, but it kind of got me thinking like, now I'm really curious about this. There's a lot of things that are lining up and I want to pursue an official diagnosis, which again, not everybody has the opportunity to do for a whole variety of reasons. I was very lucky that I was able to find a practitioner who's licensed to practice in my state and licensed to diagnose me and that I was able to get that time in a reasonable amount of scheduling and actually get that diagnosis. But a lot of people are self-diagnosed for a whole variety of reasons and, and that's valid as well. But for me, I wanted to go with the official diagnosis. How does it look different in women and girls? It is the same condition, the stereotype that a lot of not only just people in general have, but even a lot of clinicians and people in healthcare, even they have about what autism looks like. And because all, almost all the research coming up was done with little white, relatively affluent boys, that's sort of the model that we tend to have. It's like that with a lot of parts of healthcare as well. With girls in general, sometimes the challenges is that girls tend to what's called mask better, which means you're able to sort of cover your autistic traits and either you're really good at paying attention to what other people are doing around you and you kind of mimic them either in your behaviors or your facial expressions or you kind of feel like oh this is what I'm supposed to do in a social situation I think it's a society thing I girls and women in general even neurotypical girls and women are encouraged to mask and cover their behaviors more to conform to a lot of pieces of society so that flows through with autism diagnoses so I think in some cases that could be why it's not picked up as much in girls and women. But even just women and girls get pegged as being oversensitive and, and fussy. And there's a stereotype about autistic people not having empathy, which is actually not true at all. They may not display it and express it in the same ways as other people do. That's really a range. Some, some autistic people have too much empathy. Everything is overwhelming. So I don't know if that's necessarily specific to, to gender, but it's just other things to keep in mind is that there's more than just sort of this one one strict model that a lot of us grew up with. And especially once you get to a diagnosing women, then you've had a whole lifetime of masking and covering your behaviors. For me, it was important to find someone who had experience diagnosing women specifically, because believe it or not, there are different tests that you can do for autism. Some are better for women, grown women, some are better for grown men, and there are totally different ones for children. So there's a lot, there's a lot to learn about this. Is there a conversation coming up on Beyond Six Seconds that you're really excited about in the near future? Eric Garcia, who's an autistic journalist, his main job is reporting on like po politics and economics, but he also started reporting on autism related stories. And he wrote a book last year called We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation. 
one of my big reach guests that I wanted to, to read because I, you know, I had his audio book and I listened to it when it came out last year. It's like, oh my gosh, I would love to interview him because the book really talks about government policy in the United States really shaped the conversation about autism, which you don't think about it. You think about all these other things, but it's like, no, really there were policy decisions being made by, you know, certain groups of people who had power and were, were very vocal. And that shapes why we see it hear things about autism the way that we do, which is just fascinating. So I actually, I was connected to him on Instagram and reached out to uh, see if he wanted to be on my show. He's okay. Yeah. Here's my publicist. So I'm chill in my podcast and not like super controversial, but he really brings it. So we talk like about some kind of hot button issues there, which is actually pretty fun. Awesome. Oh, Carolyn, I can't wait to hear. I'm obviously a huge fan of the podcast and, and have been, I think we actually did like one of the tester uh, when you were just getting everything all set up. I remember that we were testing out Skype to see if I could figure it out like way back in the day. Yes. And I'm so excited to have seen it just blow up and you just have such a, a following and a community. And it's just, it's so wonderful um, to be able to be on the sidelines and, and cheering you on. So I love that. If, if people want to hear more about you, about the podcast, where do they go? How do they find out more about you? Sure. So the best place to go is to my website. It's beyond six seconds.net. And that's the number six. And you can find links to all my social media there. You can sign up for my newsletter where I give people sneak previews of episodes right before they come out. All my episodes are on the website. So you can find there, they're all categorized. So you can uh, find all my stuff there. Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us at Joy Project. I really hope that you will come back and and chat with us again. This has been such a joy for me uh, to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here. I'd love to. Thanks so much. I'm so happy you got to meet Carolyn. She's somebody who has enriched my life in so many different ways. And she's actually the person who inspired me to start this podcast. I'm honored she took time to join us here on Joy Project. I hope she's inspired you to broadcast your own stories and lift up the voices of others too. On the webpage of this episode at crustaavampato.com slash joyproject, you'll find links to Carolyn's website, her social media handles, and links to the resources and topics we discussed. And if you subscribe to her newsletter, she gives you a checklist to start your own podcast. So head over to beyond6seconds.net and subscribe to see an outline of steps from a pro. At the end of every episode, I share something that's related to the episode that brought me joy this week. And in podcast land, there is so much joy to be had. As Carolyn explained, there's a lot that goes into creating a podcast. Booking guests, determining the topics, recording and editing episodes, research, marketing, writing show notes. The list is really endless. And I am learning so much as I start this podcasting journey. And I wanted to share a few tools that I found helpful in case you want to start your own podcast. I've started using Zencaster for interview recording. A couple weeks ago, Zoom put the 40 minute limit on all free accounts. And sometimes my interviews run over. So I had to find a better tool. I also wanted to find something that had a little bit higher quality when recording. Zoom is great, but I really felt like there could be some improvement in the recording. So I found Zencaster, Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. It has really been a great tool for me. You haven't heard any episodes yet that use it, but you will shortly. So if you're looking for a replacement for Zoom to do some recording, I highly recommend Zencaster. As far as audio editing, I use a really simple program called Twisted Wave. There's a lot of different editing programs out there, but I find that Twisted Wave is just very simple. It only has the tools that I absolutely need to edit the podcast. It's a pretty small one-time fee for the software that you put onto your computer, so I highly recommend that one. I started making audiograms for marketing. I thought that would be a fun way to market the podcast. Basically what it is is a static image that's converted into a video with photos, text, audio, a waveform, and then transcriptions that go over it. So far I've been using a site called headliner.com to create them, but there's lots of different options out there, different ways to create them, and I'm still investigating all of them. Once they're created, I share the audiograms on Instagram, and it's just been a really fun way to put the content out there in a different type of format. So I hope you have fun making audiograms too. If you want to take a look at mine, you can find them on my YouTube channel and you can also find them on Instagram at Krista Rose NYC and on my Twitter account, Krista NYC. As far as episode transcripts, 
doing the transcripts was really important to me because I really wanted to expand access to the podcast. And I also wanted to give people an easy way to get links and resources that I talk about with our different guests. So I just post the transcript up on the page for each episode. I really wanted to find something that had high quality transcripts. There's a lot of different tools out there. Some of them that I used at first were really wonky. They didn't do a good job of transcribing. But then I found this tool called otter.ai, just like the animal, O-T-T-E-R dot A-I. Again, really reasonable price, just like Twisted Wave, has everything I need. It's a really fantastic tool and it does a really great job of putting in timestamps, of recognizing different voices. It even gets a lot of words that are very uncommon. Absolutely right. So I really recommend otter.ai for transcripts. Canva is another great digital tool that is great for marketing. One thing that I wanted to do was pull out some key quotes from each of the interviews and put them into a really beautiful visual that then I could share on sites like Instagram. I found Canva. It creates posters. I can embed them really easily into social media. I also put them up on the episode's webpage. Um, Canva, again, is a free tool and it works perfectly for exactly this use. As far as hosting the podcast, I use something called Anchor. So two years ago, when I first started thinking about this podcast, I went to a class at the New York Public Library about podcasting. And in that class, I learned about Anchor. And it's a free tool that can host and distribute a podcast. It did take me a little while to get everything set up. That's not Anchor's fault. It's just that setting up an RSS feed for a podcast is a process because there are so many different podcast platforms out there and I wanted to be on them, all of them. (laughs) So if you're setting up your podcast, I definitely recommend taking some time. You don't want to be setting up your RSS feed the night before you plan to launch. You really want to give yourself maybe a week or even two before you launch to make sure that everything is up and running on all the different platforms. So far, I found Anchor is really easy to use. And again, it's another free tool. For the website, kristaavampato.com slash joyproject, I use WordPress. And I've been using WordPress for personal and business websites for years. And rather than create a whole nother website, I really just wanted to create a section of my personal site where I can put all of the Joy Project information. This way it sits alongside all my other content that I create and I don't have to manage a completely separate site. You can get all the information about this podcast at kristaavampato.com slash joyproject. And that's where you can find a way to play all the episodes. You can find the bio of each person I interview, all the resources we talk about, transcripts, everything that you ever wanted to know about an episode. It's all there on the website. You'll also find some really beautiful imagery on the website. And I have to give props to a site called Unsplash fantastic site to learn about photographers who want to share their work. Many of the images are free to use. It's easy to search the site and the photographs are just beautiful and very, very inspiring. The thing that I really recommend is that you just play around with all of the different tools that are out there and see what combo works for your podcast. When you're first starting out, see how much you can get for free and only spend money when it's truly worth it. Links to all these resources, tools, a transcript of this episode, and social media accounts are available at kristaavampato.com slash joyproject. Let me know the tools you use for podcasting that you love because I really want to learn from you too. In addition to this conversation with Carolyn, I also record a mini episode of Joyful News each week. And in these mini episodes, I gather stories from around the globe that spark joy to share with all of you. You can find those episodes also at kristaavampato.com slash joyproject and everywhere that you listen to podcasts. Have a joy-filled week, everyone, and thanks for being here with us on The Joy Project. I'll be back in two weeks on May 31st with another interview episode and a joyful news mini episode. As always, I look forward to the conversation.